So, Crash Bash. Crash Bandicoot. You got some nerve setting foot into my domain without an invitation. I know all of your tricks by this point. You see this here? This is a beard of a wise man. I've seen some shit in my time. I know you tried to pull the wool over our eyes by disguising your lack of original ideas as a party game, but oh, mister, no, 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 you're not following me. You'll always be the beginning of Crash's mediocre downfall. And you've got no tricks up your sleeves. You can't surprise me. Just you try it. Why don't you turn around then? Yeah, there's a wall behind me. There can't be any- Oh. You're going to try going back to the classic formula, aren't you? You're goddamn right. <laughs> Greetings and salutations, my beautiful people, and welcome to the Kedekura Show, where I always have to do the duty to deciding whether or not things deserve to be slaughtered or salvaged. And today, I'm going to be <laughs> with a game that I've had tons of requests for ever since I stopped my Crash Bandicoot. Can I after I stopped talking about Crash 3, and that was nearly five years ago. Yeah, better late than never. So let's dive once again into the strange world of Crash Bandicoot as we tackle The Wrath of Cortex. Crash 4 was easily the most ambitious Crash game at the time in terms of scale and spectacle, and people had high hopes for it since it was his sixth generation console debut that wasn't PlayStation exclusive anymore, and without the original team that made him the superstar unofficial mascot he was in the 90s. It's in 60 FPS, the levels are much bigger, there's hundreds more boxes to break, more areas to run, a metric shit ton more vehicles, so many more level varieties that some level themes come for one stage and then go forever and are never revisited. It controls smoothly and beautifully apart from a few places, it brings back all the familiar mechanics from the last games like bonus platforms, time trial relics, gems and crystals, death routes you can only access by getting to it without dying in a stage, secret coloured gems to find at the end of alternate level paths which then open other paths and platforms in other stages for revisiting and extra challenges. It's basically Crash 3 on steroids. And loads of people hated this game for its lack of innovation, but in my opinion, it's the total opposite. I think it tried way too fucking hard. It's one of the most unfocused games I've ever played in my life. And yes, I know that I put it in my top 10 video games that I do like and no one else does video a couple of years back, but again, have you seen this beard? I'm a wiser man now. And I don't like it as much anymore. No use chatting about it though, so let's actually play it. My name is Flannels, Ooh. obviously. And we kick off with a nearly 10 minute intro cutscene. Oh boy. I'm not gonna lie, this is pretty boring. There's barely any movement and you have to just sit there and watch all of the awesome villains from Crash 3 mope and whinge about how they can't beat Crash, and then watch the good guys just sit around and listen to Aku Aku ramble on for minutes and minutes. Oh, it's just nothing interesting happens, but at least you get to see all the PS2 power going into those magnificent Cortex eyebrows. They're like eagles! Fucking America! The story follows right after the end of Crash 3, and this time Cortex doesn't just want world domination, but outright states he wants Crash dead now. Fuck. And that's a good terrifying motivation for Cortex because despite the graphical leap, he somehow looks less expressive than in the PS1 games, and Uka Uka looks like a fucking fancy dress mask compared to his diabolical PS1 days. What the hell happened here? Either way, in order to rip Crash to pieces, Cortex finishes off another Bandicoot genetic monster to fight him. Which I also like because Crash was of course a creation of Cortex in the first game that failed on him, so it's like you're going against the Bandicoot that you were supposed to be. Along with that, Uka Uka also wants to awaken four insanely destructive masks known as the Elementals, who are also so evil that they were all solely responsible for all the natural disasters on Earth for centuries before they were locked up. Although when Aku Aku learns about this horrific news, he doesn't seem to care that much and just sounds like a concerned mother. No, not the elementals. Ooga, ooga. Did you forget to tidy your room? Oh well, at least we do get to hear one of the masks voiced by Mark Hamill. That's pretty awesome, if a little bit too close to another character. Destroy him! And despite no Naughty Dog being here, it's cool to hear Clancy Brown back as Cortex and Uka Uka. And it's also good that the PS2 could render out roughly 300 more teeth for Cortex. <laughs> so yeah, pretty lackluster introduction. Not terrible, just quite... Now it is very important to understand that Wrath of Cortex is such a radically weird and different Crash game that the only way I can talk about it properly, I figured when I was writing the script, was to talk about each level individually. So enough pickles and pimples and let's kick off. Level 1, Arctic Antics, let's go. Oh look, we even get the floating head taunting us like in Crash 3. This one voiced by Thomas F. Wilson of all people. What are you looking at, fuzzhead? What are you looking at, butthead? I see what they did there! Oh yes, the loading times. I remember these being atrocious on PS2. Let's get ready for it then.
Oh! The loading times weren't actually that bad at all. I remember them being bloody terrible when I was younger. Maybe it was because I was so much more impatient. I don't know, but... They used to be a lot worse than that. I could swear to God that was one of the main complaints about the game. They're not that lot... What? Have I got a better PS2 or something? Oh well, I'm happy either way, whatever. I'm also very happy to say that this is an amazing intro level and has everything you'd expect. Cool and varied enemies, decent platforming to introduce you to the game, an optional easy death route if you don't die first go, and a chance to grab a coloured gem. It even fixes ice physics a bit from the last game to make them a little bit more manageable and easy to control yourself on. Also, the music. Great shit, on to level 2, Tornado Alley. It's a flying combat stage like in Crash 3, but uh, <sighs> extremely slow. And whenever you turn, it's so sensitive that you feel like you're careening off towards fucking Neptune. <laughs> It's also ridiculously easy with enemies that just completely ignore you. I mean, it's arguably not too bad for stage two, but still not as good as the flying stages from Crash 3, so overall a disappointment. Stage three then has you rolling around in a big ball. Jesus, am I playing Crash Bandicoot or fucking Action 52? We're three stages in and we've had one awesome introduction level to a Crash game, but that's one platforming level out of the first three levels. Can we not just focus on getting the platforming great first before all this experimenting? Is that too much to ask? Luckily though, I love this stage. It's so awesome if a little bit jarring. All you do is follow a load of tubes and paths rolling around really fast and smashing boxes constantly and the controls are just right. Responsive to your input so you can easily stop if you roll a bit too far and it's good for going really fast. And there's enough resistance in the physics that it feels just right when you want to move momentum from one very fast speed and turn yourself around. It's also a very pretty level and there's even some alternate faster paths for relic time trials that have nitro crates to avoid as your risk for taking them. Really cool stuff here. The controller vibrations as you roll around are also incredible, I cannot get enough of them. Stage 4, Wizards and Lizards, is also a great level. Slightly like Arctic Antics, but much more energetic and a little bit trickier. The castle setting is great, the enemies are all pretty tricky to avoid, the platforming can be pretty multitasky, and there's another death route that's much harder than Stage 1. You even get an exciting badass chase sequence with a fucking dragon. Also, once again, the music. God damn, yes, this is what I played a PS2 Crash game for. Wonderful stuff. Stage 5 is an okay level. The Indiana Jones opening is incredible with the speed, controls, fast reaction, gameplay, vibrations, and even an alternate tricky gem path. But then you collide with the end of the track and begin the main level, which is slightly pathetic in comparison. There's barely any platforming, and the enemies have some of the most confusing placements I've ever seen. They barely get in the way, and any weapons they have you can just fucking run around or stand right next to. With the bigger wider levels in this game, did no one think to use more enemies to fill them out? I just feel bad for killing them, it's like they're doing their little factory jobs, they aren't in the way or anything. But hey, at least, once again I have to stress, the music! Yeah, excellent music is a theme in this game. Every track is amazing. I'd give you a preview for every stage, but we'd be here all day, so just search it on YouTube and make love to it. And after that level, once all of the warp room toilets are backed up, you can then fight Crunch Bandicoot. Oh, already? <laughs> That was quick. Well, actually, in one of the game's lamest aspects, Crunch is the only boss in the game, and one that you have to fight with each different elemental mask giving him his power. Yeah, just the one boss, so what's the point of the wasted intro teasing you on fighting every classic Crash 3 boss, or if not, every classic Crash boss helping Crunch out? Like a two versus one battle, why are they even here if they don't get used? Also, Crunch is voiced by the same guy that does Gantu in Lilo and Stitch, and it just ruins everything. Let's finish this. Let's finish this. I get to wrap my fingers around your puny orange neck. Um, puny orange neck? Dude, have you even seen Crash? He's fucking hench. He's so hench that he hasn't even got a neck. He's just one big face with arms. Anyway, this here is a shit fight. Take the awesome ball rolling and make a boss that involves hitting smaller balls before he does. That's the boss. Enjoy it. Nothing changes other than the amount of balls to hit. And because Crunch is on fire, he can cancel out the balls that you just hit. And if he converts them, all you can really do without losing health yourself is wait for them to cool down before you can hit them again. It's not difficult or anything, but it takes ages. And with the weird bowl design, it's so difficult to control around 
could avoid crunch and hit all of the randomly moving tiny balls going really fast all at the same time. And to make things even better, you unlock the most useless power-up in gaming history, sneaking on top of specific lines of explosive nitro crates. Yes, not being able to jump on the top of any nitro crate, sneaking on specifically placed lines of them. That's it. That's all the power-up does. So that was kind of shit, but maybe it picks up in World 2. Stage 6 belongs to a pretty good and beautiful jungle level that goes back to the basics. And you also get to meet the next elemental mask, Wawa. That's a fucking awful name. Bizarrely enough though, Ali Ermi is the voice actor for the mask, which is weird to hear absolutely, but still something hilarious nonetheless. I'll fix that attitude problem of yours! Well, I don't know, it's funny to me. What do you think, Wawa? You can come over to my house and fuck my sister. Alrighty then. And yeah, it's pretty and the platforming is good, but there are lame enemies once again, which is all made up with a fantastic ending sequence with chasing rhinos and a bouncy and brilliantly fun jeep, and with Wumper Fruits doing their guidance job through this bit perfectly. You even get to try out sneaking for the first time in the two or three uses it has in the entire game. As you can see, it's a boring and useless power-up, but yes, at least Crash looks smooth as fuck when he uses it. <laughs> As you can see with all the vehicles and different gameplay styles we've had so far, the diversions are starting to become a lot clearer the more we play the game. And so far it's been more hit than miss, admittedly. But then stage 7 happens. This, this is, is one, one of the worst, worst levels, levels of the, the game. game. It looks great and controls decently, like Crash 3, but where occasionally there's too much horizontal movement in ground levels to make it too easy, there's now too much vertical movement to make it too hard. There's so much space to swim that you spend more time checking above and below for boxes than needed, and there's way too many cheap shitty shots with these bombs that drop from the ceiling. You spend the entire level going down these shafts here, and then when you get to this one, oh, don't do it because it's a trap. You have to go to the thing that looks like a wall. Once you're in the submarine with the torpedoes and bombs, you'd think it would be great fun, but far from it. Unlike a temporary active bonus for staying careful and alive, like with that thing in Crash 3, this thing is a permanent fixture and kills you if you take a hit without Aku Aku. It makes you a bigger target that moves too fast to the right, but doesn't stop and turn around anywhere near fast enough, so any bomb noise you hear means it might be too late for you even to turn around and miss the fucking thing, and some bombs are even behind the scenery. Jesus. It's not fun, you spend the whole stage inching along and spamming torpedoes, and it does outstay its welcome quite a bit. But then, miraculously, at stage 8, Bonsai Bonsai, we're back at Fantastic. You get to play as Coco in a platforming stage for the first time ever, who does do less than Crash to be fair, but the entire stage is more akin to Arctic Antics and Wizards and Lizards. They're platforming linear gauntlets that are always shifting perspectives and throwing threats at you everywhere that are actually in the way. And yes, the platforming is pretty challenging, with platforms that vanish if you take too long, there's side bits, top bits, timing bits, there's fantastic music and a fantastic fantastic location. It's quintessential Crash, and Crash isn't even on it! Sadly though, on to stage 9, we're back in a flight stage, but it's easily the worst in the whole game. Instead of instant rapid fire bullets from before, you now have to pick one target at a time, hold a button down to lock on, and then let go to fire. You have to hit 6 targets 3 times each, bullets and enemies are absolutely fucking everywhere and give you no quick way to attack back, it's just not fun or well designed at all, despite how good it does look. Level 10 then starts shit with more submarine stuff, but it very quickly ends up being a decent crash affair with tight and precise platforming and actual danger. I can also use this stage and its tiny platforms to gush about the controls and how they don't make any of this game frustrating. In my opinion, Traveller's Tales nailed this. The weight, the speed, Crash's satisfying animation reacting as you spin the analog stick and how it reacts to every tiny adjustment to your thumb, the way that jumping off of boxes feels just right and you hang in the air for just the right amount of time, they make every ground stage, no matter how great or mediocre it is, a joy from Crash's movement in the game. Unfortunately, it isn't enough to save yet another bad boss battle. Well, I mean, it's better than the first boss, and it's actually a platforming Crash boss, but it's still pathetic. It reminds me a bit of Entropy from Crash 3, but much less aggressive and way too easy. I mean, look at my footage sped up and witness what a piece of piss this boss is. <laughs> Yeah. The real question is though, what did I expect from an enemy called Wawa? World 3 is the dominion of Mark Hamill Mask, also known as Pyro. It looks flammable! And level 11, the gauntlet, is indeed an accurate description. It's another great ground stage back on form again, but the gauntlet referring to the coloured gem challenge is more than accurate than the actual level. It's extremely hard, but great stuff and genuinely challenging. I even noticed here that they use the old sound effects ripped straight from the old games, with all of the compressed bit crush sounds and everything. <laughs> 
It's totally adorable and I love it. But even though they remixed the Crash 3 Warp Room theme, they didn't use the old Invincible Aku Aku tune that was used in every main Crash game. It's a staple, you can't not use it. It's also a much shorter sequence compared to the other games, which is yet another element that copies from previous games but somehow makes them more disappointing. Stage 12 isn't disappointing though, it's another great Coco stage. Great platforming, cool enemies that are a nuisance to avoid, and box break challenges galore, topped up with an awesome ending sequence being chased by the titular tsunami the level is named after. It's also great how even though it's the same theme as the last Coco stage, not only is the weather totally different, but the music is different too. If there's anything you can't fault the Wrath of Cortex on, it's its effort in presentation variety. Stage 13 is then basically Hog Ride from Crash 3, you know, the racing with the bikes, but with the bouncier and much more slippy and fun jeep from the jungle stage. Dare I say it's even better than Crash 3's bike stages, it's a lot more fun. I also nearly fell down a hole, but my mastery of video games wouldn't let me. Stage 14 is another ball stage, a lot trickier than before, but still so much fun to me. There's a lot more treachery in the tighter stage design and a lot less ultra fast rolling, but getting around the different heighted hills I never found frustrating because of the awesome physics and resistance that Crash puts up when you control him in the direction you want to go. The ball did what I expected when I used the controls in a specific way. And hey, going up these tubes is always a laugh. <laughs> The only thing I don't like about this stage, and like two other ball stages in the entire game, is how depressing it is to see all of the potentially great bosses from Crash 3 go to complete waste. They only appear in these stages, and they're clearly utilised in a pathetic way to justify them being in a direct sequel to Crash 3. What the fuck, Tiny? What are you doing? This to this. This to this. This said this. I mean, you might as well have not even used them in the game at all. I don't even know what you- oh, How did you get over that? <laughs> Stage 15 is very visually impressive and begins with a quick send off to Crash 2's jetpack levels. It controls identically, but a lot slower, so it's a lot easier to do and more fun to use, not to mention less floaty. I don't mind this section personally, but bearing in mind loads of people hated Crash 2's jetpack stages, it seems a bit weird to redo it. And perhaps another example of the devs just using everything they can from previous games just for the sake of it. Luckily though, in one of the rare occasions, it's better than it was before, so that's a good thing at least. Either way, it's over in 90 seconds even if you don't like it, and then we're on to more good crash platforming, including an incredibly cool Total Recall send-up. Look at this shit, it's so cool. Oh wait, enemies don't get skeletons? Oh, okay, that's just fucking lazy. Here I even discovered the old death animation from Crash 1. Now that is cute. Unfortunately though, I also rediscovered the worst nightmare of any Crash fan and missed one fucking box. Hello darkness, my old friend. Boss 3 now, and it's... Okay. It's definitely harder than the previous two with the amount of shit you have to avoid, but it's just not that interesting of a concept. You run away, run back, and spray crunch. Repeat three times, and it's over. It's okay, though, and it's not too easy to avoid all of the rocks that are being thrown at you, especially when they start breaking up into two, but... I don't know, what do you think, Wawa? You had best unfuck yourself, or I will unscrew your head and check down your neck! Okay then, I'll ask Crunch instead. I could take this crash punk out with my metal arm tied behind my bedak. All right, maybe not. Stage 16, Avalanche, is yet another good Coco stage. There's some basic stuff from beginning to end, but it does have some very fun little ice slide sections and even a really cool snowboarding bit at the end with a hidden gem challenge of boarding through all of the checkpoint flags on the way down. We also get to meet the next mask, Lolo, oddly enough voiced by the guy currently doing Crash's voice, even in the upcoming PS4 remakes. This is the hero I have to blow away? <laughs> Seems like a bunch of hot air to me. And Lolo is probably the most boring and least threatening mask in the whole game that says absolutely nothing of any worth. Fortunately though, stage 17 is another cool crash stage. It's good to see more consistency here, and it even brings back the exceedingly fun monkey bars from 2 and 3. Oh, oh wait. Oh no, you've got to be fucking kidding me. You're pulling my chain. You're... You're wanking my elbow. I liked the idea of staying safe and not fixing anything that wasn't broken in the last games, but... If you're gonna take all these elements from previous games that worked and were fun to use, why would you make them not as fun or good? Just compare to Crash 3! Yeah! Later on in the level, you even get another movie reference, an alien's power loader with a fruit bazooka from Crash 3 built on it, which is terrific as an idea, but when it becomes a life or death stapled hindrance more than an optional bonus like the submarine from earlier, it just makes the level not that fun. This thing can't attack normally, you have to aim and shoot everything painfully slowly. Compared that to the bazooka in Crash 3 that was a boss power-up and could be used for what it was designed for, firing long distances, but could also be used without, you know, it just makes things easier when you need them to be easier for.
for you. Now make it a permanent fixture in a suit that kills you at one touch if you haven't got Aku Aku, and it's just pants. Especially considering the reference, why can't you like do combos with your fists or something? You even get the bazooka as a power up later on in the game, so what's the point of this armor? How does it benefit me? Make the level fun or interesting? There isn't even really any special ways the bazooka is used. There's no target practice, no switches to smack, nothing like that. You can throw in all of the gem types, power ups after bosses, time trial relics that unlock a secret warp room and more levels and a secret ending after getting everything and other previous crash game things to a T. But if you can't reach the same level of quality you're emulating or fail to have a good reason to change the stuff you're changing, stop! Stage 18 is fun though, thank fuck. It's a classic Coco ship stage from Crash 3 that does everything more correct and more fun than previous flying stages and has more things to avoid to boot. This is the funny thing though, the game jumps in quality constantly so it's so hard to determine whether or not- is there a draft in here? Is that it? Oh, fuck me. And rip out my leg hair and call me Sandra! Stage 19 has every same problem as the last water levels and I can't be fucked to even show it. So level 20 stops steaming my kettle and goes back on track and to the point. But still, it's only just okay. It's another good crash stage, nothing more or less. Hello, dark. And with that, we're nearly at the end of our journey. All the highs and lows have been very clear, but still, there is no concrete thing I can say that would give it a- Not used to the weather here, I a wimp. <laughs> Your script writer needs to be fired. Or even better, let's fight it ourselves. Boss 4 is the best boss by far, but for an engine ripoff from Crash 3, once again, it pales in comparison. Compare the utter challenging insanity and ridiculous colors and particles flying everywhere on the PS1 from Crash 3, oh, and multiple phases, of course, and then watch this. Singular phase, slow, tired, barely anything attacking you, Snorfest. Another case of copying elements that worked in the last games, but somehow making them worse off. <laughs> This is becoming a more prominent theme the more the game goes on. I don't know, what do you think, Wawa? I will gouge out your eyeballs and skull fuck you! Stage 21 and we're back on form. Climbing a volcano, going around it, avoiding rocks and platforming over lava, cool slamming bird enemies, it's all good stuff. It's also worth saying that I got the death tornado spin after boss 3, and unlike Crash 3 when there's not only huge platforming shortcuts to take at nearly every stage with the death tornado glide by spinning and double jumping together, and optional challenges hidden away by this gliding mechanic, in Wrath of Cortex, this was the first time I used the death tornado spin and double jump together, and I used it once afterwards, even when backtracking through other stages for coloured gems. It's useful in the game, absolutely, but compared to Crash 3's uses, it feels tacked on without thought yet again. The only major saving grace from that slight misstep, though, is that the double jump is arguably more useful here than any other part of Crash 3, with the bigger levels and higher jumps, and the death tornado spinning in the water is admittedly incredible. It's fast and attacks at the same time. What more do you need? Stage 22, Gold Rush, is another fun level. Very fast-paced and interesting, just not that great. No single stage feels alike, even if it's in the same theme, which is fantastic, and I got a lot of use out of the bazooka in this level, you know, when it isn't being forced onto you. And here is yet another example of taking elements from the last games and making them worse. I'm getting tired of saying it. Invincibility mode is already not as long, but now you don't even move faster, including on the monkey bars. Like Crash 3, which was already faster on the bars without the invincibility mask. Why is this mechanic so lacking? I mean, once I activate Super Aku Aku here, I barely move a few feet before it's over. My lord! Stage 23, though, is yet another great ball stage, one of my favourites, with lots of technology mixed with a castle and lots of tricky balancing, but now with even worse classic boss integration. It's not even trying here anymore and it's fucking sad. Oh, I don't know, what do you think, Wawa? It looks to me like the best part of you ran down to cracking your mama's ass and ended up as a brown stain on the mattress! Okay, I really need to stop asking you for your opinion. Stage 24 then uses the power loader, I'm glad to report, really well in a fucking epic chase sequence, one of the best chases in the game, and with barely any use of the forced awkward shooting and platforming. I've got not much else to say, it's classic crash but with a badass power loader. Then in the final main stage, that epicness is followed up by another brilliant level, Cortex Vortex, where all of my powers came into use, there's the super secret gauntlet where you need every coloured gem to beat it, a segment where you destroy everything as invincible Aku Aku, and genuinely good platforming design for some tight and consistent crash gaming. It's also worth saying that belly flops are a lot better than 2 and 3 as well, the animation is stretchier, and he's up and at him right away instead of lying there like a dumbass for a second like in the older games. As for Boss 5, well, yeah, I've played better bosses, but it's probably the best in the game. Every elemental mask is 
is used in a weird pattern and they can either kill you or immobilize you. Every power-up comes in handy, I mean you have to bazooka crunch to beat him, and avoiding every different elemental attack is pretty exciting, they all do different things and it's really cool. We need Coco here though for a big old bandicoot reunion, Coco Crash and Crunch. Wait, Coco Crash Crunch sounds like a breakfast cereal. And no, I don't want to play the secret levels because the thought of replaying some of these levels for all the relics makes me want to cry, so I'm stopping right here. Well... Overall, Crash Bandicoot the Wretch of Cortex <laughs> is nothing too special, all things considered. It's great in the places when it's the same as the last games, shit when it tries to desperately copy elements from those games but somehow doing them worse, and far too up its own ass to notice how weird some of the experimental gameplay parts actually are when there was a fantastic base game here that could have been the perfect PS2 Crash 3 follow-up if it just stuck to a more consistent formula. Yeah, I know that Crash is famous for splicing vehicle segments and stuff in the previous games, but not only were they quite far between each other, but actually were really fun and didn't counteract or combat any of the game's main mechanics. They were still really fun to play and incredibly satisfying. This game just doesn't seem to have any clue what it wants to do with itself, and even when it does have a focus and it does know what it wants to do, it then bars itself with alien and questionable design choices. This isn't a terrible game by any stretch of the imagination, but replaying it today has left me disappointed by the whole thing. It's ridiculously mediocre. Five out of fucking ten. So do you know what that means? This game gets the slawvage today. <laughs> And until next time, if it's your birthday today or watching this video, happy freaking birthday to you, and please remember to stay beautiful. Hey everybody, and stay tuned for the outtakes that'll be on in just a second, because first, I'd love to thank the sponsors for today's video, thepixelempire.com. Did you like all of those awesome Bioshock posters in my living room? Well, that's where they came from, the Pixel Empire, so go and pick them up. Go and have a look in the description. You'll also find on the site all of my official merchandise, and if you click on the link in the description, you'll have an automatic special caddy discount. So, yeah, merchandise, awesome game posters and even phone cases what more do you need thank you for listening everybody and enjoy the outtakes Subscribe. greetings and salutations my bit where is the microphone on yeah it is it's we're good we're good Stank. <coughs> hello oh i get a cuddle today yeah better late than never fuck it <laughs>